Hi everybody, it's Dr. Davis. Welcome back to week two. I hope week one went well for you and I really enjoyed reading your introductions and getting to know you. Um, I'm bummed that we're not meeting in person and can't have that uh, personal relationship, but still looking forward to getting to know y'all online. So let's get started on week two, which is chapter two, research and clinical methods. Um, y'all, this is a lot of information. Um, I'm gonna try to chunk my lectures um, because, I mean, there's nothing worse than like an hour and a half long video or somebody droning on. So, and you know, I don't want to drone on. So let's get started. Um, with our research methods, the oldest is microscopic evaluations. And that's just, you know, examining cells under a microscope, which started a long time ago, like in the mid 1800s. Um, now, uh, they still use microscopic techniques to examine postmortem brain pathology. Um, there are techniques that are used to store, or no, the techniques that are used to store, uh, freeze, and dissect the brains, though, vary according to site. And so there really is no standardized way of um, doing that, which kind of maybe can create some problems in a research-based kind of effort if it's not all done the same. But there is an agreement that the brains should be processed as soon after death as possible um, to preserve the tissue. Of course, the limitations are that the examination can only occur after death and not while the behavior is occurring. And um, that also that systematic and highly detailed evaluations usually only occur in large medical centers. And the next technique is ablation, which is a surgical technique that involves in removing or destroying portions of neural tissue or brain uh, regions without causing death. Uh, our book says to animals that it is only used in animals, but actually I have um, sort of personal experience of someone in my family um, having it done recently and she's still alive. Um, so this also dates back to the early 1800s and originally was used to determine the locations of various cognitive, motor, and behavior abilities in animals. Um, they can still assist in determining general estimates of, specific, of where the specific sites are of brain-based functions. Um, the concerns are is that it involves animal research and there is a little aside in your book about the ethics of animal research that you should read. Um, missing the target is a concern because what it does is it just uses a radio frequency to kind of kill nerves at that area. And uh, the research is not conducted in humans, but I'm wondering if that's an old uh, thing in our book, because again, I know somebody uh, it's happened to. Um, pra uh, practitioners, now, too, it's not a standalone technique, so the ones who, practitioners who use it, use advanced uh, studies or techniques such as MRIs when performing ablations in humans. And so the person I know is my mom who uh, had multiple broken vertebrae, and so she was in excruciating back pain that wasn't responsive to medication. And so they did go in and do ablation, and it was a bit of a guessing game. Um, it is a temporary fix, but she has felt better, and uh, they just have, it's in her spine. You can't see. I don't know. I'm even gesturing, um, but it does. It just basically kills those nerves at that point. It, that's sort of sending the pain signals. Um, it's also used uh, for cardiac things to kind of get your heart back in rhythm, and then also um, there's intramitral ablation, which can help with uh, very heavy menstrual flow. Okay, so now we're going to move on to electrophysiology recordings, starting with the single cell technique. And in that, an electrode is inserted next to a brain cell to record the electrical activity with the goal of learning about the functioning of that specific neuron, which then helps differentiate between neurons. Uh, the drawbacks is that it's very time consuming to just go one neuron at a time. That would take forever. Um, it's only done in animals. And we can't do it in humans because we just have too many uh, neurons to examine. Um, the next is the uh, electroencephalogram, which records electrical activity in the brain via electrodes placed on the scalp by measuring extracellular, which means outside of the cell, current flow of neurons. Um, I posted a video called How Do Brain Scans Works that includes uh, how an EEG work. So go ahead and watch that instead of me boring you. Um, next thing is event related potentials, which also uses EEG technology to record electrical activity in response to stimulation, like auditory, visual, somatosensory, which is um, pressure, pain, uh, warmth, cold, uh, or cognitive stimuli. 
um, what it does is looks at the activity during the specific brain processing that happens, like say if your stroke done the, on your hand. So how is your brain responding at that moment? And it measures the brainwave reactions to repetitive stimuli to determine how different information is processed. And so what if we do it here? What if we do it there? What if we do it here? And how is that different? Um, so ERPs don't identify where the information is generated. So it's not like, oh, this is coming from your you know, occipital lobe and then it's doing this. It's just looking at the electrical, where the electrical activity is strongest during the stimuli, during the processing. Um, EEGs and ERPs are relatively inexpensive. Um, they are conducted by trained technicians and then analyzed by neurologists. Um, next, we go into neuroimaging techniques. Um, there is, we start with structural neuroimaging, which uh, that is computed tomographic imaging, which is a CT scan or a CAT scan. Um, I posted a video last week that included the CT scan called How to MRI Pet and Cat Scans Work. If you want to go and rewatch that, that'd be great if you want to. Um, CT scans measure brain tissue density by x-raying slices of the brain. Um, so photons pass through the head and portions of the photons, of those beams of photons are absorbed by the brain tissue and then measured. Um, it's pretty efficient, pretty quick, takes about five to 10 minutes. It's relatively inexpensive and available in most community hospitals, so it's convenient. Um, it's usually used to determine whether significant brain conditions such as tumors or skull fractures are present. Uh, the limitations is that there, even though the exposure to radiation is low, we do want to limit that exposure. And so you can't really have them repeatedly. Um, they're not very detailed. And the uh, deep brain structures, you know, down really towards the base of the brain stem are difficult to capture. Um, and then there is limited ability to examine differences in gray and white matter. Uh, next is the MRI. Again, the video from last week talks about MRIs. If you want to rewatch that to refresh yourself, that would be great. So it uses nuclear magnetic resonance to obtain highly detailed 3G images of the brain using, again, multiple scans and slices. Um, so there's no radiation, so it's safe to repeat. Um, and I'm going to go ahead, and this one is a lot to take in. Uh, so it's a magnet aligns hydrogen nuclei of spinning atoms when the, ma and so they all, you know, go into the same position by using the magnet. When the magnet pulses, if you've ever heard an MRI, it's this <laughs> noise and it's very loud. I've never had one, but I hear it's very unpleasant. Um, so when the magnet, magnet pulses, the protons return to their original positions and then release energy that's detectable by radio frequency. So the result of the hydrogen atoms to the magnet results in, sorry, the hydrogen atoms aligning to the magnet um, results in images that distinguish between different tissues. Um, it is particularly useful in diagnosing traditional neurological disorders um, like strokes and trauma. It provides very clear distinctions of structural brain abnormalities, so that's really great. Um, it's good for determining whether a medical condition is causing a psychiatric problem, such as late onset psychosis or dementia. Um, it is not used to diagnose uh, eval or, eval sorry, or evaluate effectiveness of treatment for psychiatric disorders, and so you're not going to do an MRI to see how your Prozac is working. Um, the quality of the image is determined by the strength of the magnet. And so clinical magnets aren't as strong as research magnets. Um, clinical magnets are used to record lesions, tumors, ischemic alterations, and ischemia is uh, changes based on the restriction of blood flow or blood supply to tissues that result in a lack of oxygen. And of course, you know, we need oxygen, uh, our brains need oxygen to survive. Um, and uh, also other structural abnormalities. Um, then the research magnets are needed to visualize the boundary differences between various neuropathways and anatomical structures. So they have to be stronger than what we need in our clinical use of MRIs. Um, both magnets allow for examination of deep tissue brain structures, uh, gray versus white matter, and volumetric analysis 
of various brain regions, which is just a fancy way of saying the amount of space a certain region takes up in the, in the brain. Um, the challenges of an MRI is they can't be used with individuals with metal or pacemakers in their bodies. Um, there's a very narrow metal tube that you have to stay in, and that can be claustrophobic and produce anxiety in people. Um, then, of course, there are the uh, open MRIs, but they're not as strong, um, and they result in a weaker image or with a weaker image resolution. They take a while, so scanning the brain requires individuals to be very still um, throughout the whole time, and it takes about 20 to 45 minutes. And then it's more expensive than other scans, like it's you know twice the cost of the CT. So I'm going to end it there and pick up with magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, in the next video.